Oh, I'll just do the. Uh, this is the obligatory. Can you see my screen? Yes. Excellent. Okay, so I'll, I'll make a start. Um, so thank you, everyone. Thank you, Nathan, for inviting me. Um, I'm going to talk to you about some some work we're doing in Dashcam forensics. Um, and this is a work that sits on the back of a uh, paper we've written. And uh, I'll give you the link to the paper in a second uh, on one of the slides. Uh, so it's kind of two or three years now we've been doing a bit of work in uh, the Dashcam forensic space. Um, and, it, and it really began because there was a kind of there's been an increase in the number of cases being prosecuted. And uh, so this kind of, it, it, you know, we've, we've saw that there's an increase in cases being prosecuted. But what we also found was that um, there are, aren't any guidelines on how to do an investigation of dash cams. Uh, so that, that's where this research started. And obviously, as you've seen while I was speaking, I've just copied pasted the link to our paper there as well. And that's where the research started. And it has taken a number of uh, directions. I've put my email address up there. So if anyone wants to contact me after this session, you're welcome to do so. I don't mind being contacted. And I am on LinkedIn and um, you know Facebook and pretty much all the social media platforms. So feel free to stay in touch. So let me give you a bit of background. Um, so dashcam usage is rapidly increasing in the UK. Um, these figures are always two years behind. So I'm actually a year out. I need to get the 2019 figures. Uh, but there's probably no point getting them. I mean, the, the trajectory is quite clear. Um, there's more and more drivers using dash cams. And as we move forward into the domain of autonomous vehicles, the dash cams will be kind of built into most cars. So this is going to become a, a, a pretty much a standard feature in cars uh, in the next five years, I think. So um, we have got some data on uh, how, how much, you know, how, how, how many investigations there are. So, for example, up to 2017, that includes quite a few years up to 2017. That isn't just 2017. Nottingham Police recorded uh, more than 200,000 uh, dash cam records. And uh, rather than blinding you with data, I mean, it's the same in, in m almost every police constabulary, they're all coming across dash cam records and um, they're all having to deal with these. Um, when we start looking at things like audio video forensics, it, it, it's, it's a different domain to traditional kind of, I'll call it dead box forensics in that with dead box forensics, you can do a bunch of searches, you can go away, you can come back and analyze them. But with audio video forensics, Generally, you have to sit there and you have to watch it and you have to, you know, if it's an hour's worth of recording, you kind of, it kind of needs your um, attention if, if it's the audio video content you're interested in. So it is, it is a bit different to other domains. So this has become such a prevalent uh, kind of uh, a challenge in that, you know, so many police forces are having to deal with dash cam. Uh, devices that um, there's there's a number of, of police forces. This has changed since now. So there's a lot more of these that sit in this category or that one. But when we published our paper uh, last year, these were the police forces that were accepting dash cam evidence, either directly on their own website or through the next base uh, website. And these police forces here had outlined their intention to begin gathering dash cam evidence directly from the public. And those, like I say, a lot of those have now moved up to there and I haven't updated this, but, but you know, again, it's the point really here is to just show a trajectory. 
to show that more you know more police forces are are moving in that direction and that there will come a time possibly quite soon where just about every police force will be gathering dash cam evidence now they do this uh in two ways first of all what they have is um there's an incident in which case they just get it directly from uh, the, the cars involved or we have cases where the public want to kind of you know they want to donate or they want to donor or they want to you know volunteer evidence to the police because they've seen an incident so in that case that's where all of this comes into play there's lots of incidents that have been prosecuted purely on uh, dash cam evidence uh, volunteered by the public. And uh, this just a small portion of, of a table that, that I've put together. There, uh, there is an abundance of cases uh, going through the court systems uh, which have involved dash cam evidence and uh, they go from um, you, you know, someone crossing red lights all the way to uh, you know an incident where someone has been um, you know someone has been knocked over maybe and it's been recorded and we've even got and I can't remember if that one is on this table here but we've even got a, a, a small number of cases where the uh, passengers in a in a car are talking about an incident. Uh, there's one uh, a rather infamous one where there's a group of people in a car. They're about to do a hit. In other words, they're, they're planning to murder someone. And what they're doing is that they are talking about it in the car. Obviously, criminals aren't the cleverest people in the world, not realizing that the dash cam is recording it all. Uh, do the uh, you know, they, they commit the murder and then on the way back they're talking about it and if I remember there's even a phone call coming in so it's all on the dash cam and uh, so there's a whole range of cases that have been and are being prosecuted. The problem we have however is that there are no tools or guidelines on how to investigate uh, dash cams uh, that was until we published our paper. There has been one more paper published since then, but there were no no clear guidelines and uh, police officers, you know, investigating investigation teams. Uh, you know, there were, there hasn't been a case of miscarriage of justice that I know of, but um, you know, they they followed whatever they thought was the right process uh, to investigate a, a dash cam. So there's two parts to this. One is the guidelines which you know we are kind of addressing there are some you know guidance that we've put out there there's another paper that we're very close to finishing which will give very clear specifically kind of guidance on how to investigate and the other problem that we have is that there are no tools and what i mean by that is and i'll come back to this later on in case ftk x-ways do not uh, a standard unless things have changed in the last six months uh, they don't, as uh, standard, extract geospatial uh, and temporal data out of dash cam, uh, astral, you know, MP4, MOV uh, videos. Uh, with NCASE, you have, there's a special script and with other tools, there's just no easy way of doing this. So you're, you're, all, you're always left at the mercy of third party tools. So, this is uh, i'm just going to just put a little i put a little case study together just to help focus us in terms of the kind of problems that we're trying to deal with this is actually a case study that i use on my course in one of my modules um i uh give the students a bunch of dash cams with recordings on them i give them a case study each similar to the one i'm about to share with you and I asked them to, you know, find the evidence uh, that that can then be uh, presented to a court. So uh, what we have is a whole. I, I've put everything in one. This is so so so. Uh, uh, there's so much wrong here that you know I don't think there's a criminal dumb enough to have committed all these offences. But you never know. Um, 
So serious slack, multiple court orders, a restraining order preventing entry within one and a half mile radius of his ex-wife's home, uh, one and a half mile of his ex-wife's workplace. <coughs> We've got some temporal data. That's when she works. He's got a restraining order which places a curfew on travel, so he's not allowed to travel outside those hours. So there's some more temporal data there. We've got some geospatial data, some temporal data. And he he mustn't travel over 40 miles an hour. And that, that does happen. You get uh, court orders where, um, you, you, you know, individuals are ordered to fit a, a speed limiter and, and limit that limits their speed to 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 a certain speed so that that does happen and uh, so we've also got kind of we want to kind of know we want to know a bit more about speed as well so the task that i always set is is there any evidence that the suspect may have contravened any of those orders up there and any evidence that he might have altered, tampered with dates and times, or in any way tried to obfuscate his actions and movements. So that's kind of the case study that hopefully helps uh, focus us all on uh, what we're what we're trying to do here. So um, I've actually got a bunch of dash cam images, and um, they can be made available. So if someone wants to research in this area. I have got a, a whole bunch of dash cam uh, forensic images. These are uh, kind of, you know, EO ones that I've uh, created from the original SD cards. So these are the kind of questions that I wanted to ask in my research. Uh, obviously, that case study I say after I've done the research, so I kind of knew the answers to this. Um, so what is the extent of geospatial data? Where can we find it? In other words, GPS coordinates, any kind of data relating to, uh, you, you know, geospatial uh, positioning, you know, where can we extract this from? Where does it exist in that dash cam uh, recording? Um, then the next thing I want to know is, um, is it possible to forge this? If so, how easy it is, is it? Just want to go back to the previous question. It's not just the geospatial, but it's all the, also the temporal, i.e. time, and also speed. That's the other thing I want to try and uh, get to understand. So, and then finally, you know, so if it does exist, how do we extract this? What techniques can we use uh, to extract this data? So let's move on and let's look at how and, and what I did uh, to gather the data. That there is is my car. Well, it was my car in 2019, I think it was. And uh, I, 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 we, we, we got hold of, I can't remember how many, it must have been 10, 12 different dash cams. Uh, I've had a whole load sent to me since. So some of the manufacturers have voluntarily sent me a load of dash cams. Um, so I've got more. I haven't quite uh, collected data using those yet. Uh, but um, so the, the experiment quite simply was um, I used each dash cam. I examined its features. By features, I mean things like some of them have what's known as a G-sensor facility. A G-sensor detects sudden movements, number one, and it also detects kind of movements off uh, at your trajectory. So if the car suddenly moves to one side, you know, maybe there's been an accident, that's why it suddenly moved to one side, the G-sensor detects that and then what the g-sensor does is that it starts an automatic recording in uh, write uh, in read only mode so it protects the recording so it can't be overwritten because it's detected an incident effectively the g-sensor can be set to uh, typically three settings low high uh, low medium high uh, high setting, even the tiniest movement on some of these, e even literally 
just uh, kind of you know just banging softly on the windscreen will set it off. Uh, and a low setting is actually enough for a, an actual genuine accident. So that's one function. Another function is the park function, where if you turn the park function on, what happens is that the dash cam um, it, it will it it, it, it to, to enable the park function, it must have a G sensor function. So your car is parked in a car park. You've got your park function turned on. And if there's a sudden movement now while the car is parked, it will start recording. So that's someone, you know, you've parked up, someone's knocked into your car in the car park, it started to record. Um, so there's a whole bunch of features, right? And what I wanted to do was for each dash cam, make a recording with that feature turned on and with it turned off so that I could see what difference it made. Um, so if I turn the G sensor feature on and it gets activated, you know, where does it actually store that data? Does it store it in any different way? Uh, what does it actually store? Does it record the time um, that particular recording started? These are the kind of things that I wanted to understand. So each dash cam typically had about 15 to 20 different features. Uh, some not so expensive ones, some of the kind of the budget end of the market, like the Trascend is one of them, um, didn't have as many features, but the next base ones were absolutely packed with features. There were loads of features on there, and I, and I, had, to, I had to capture all these features. So typically what I would do is I'd set off on my journey to work, that is actually my, my journey to drop my daughter off at school. And yes, once upon a time, there used to be traffic like that on the roads. Um, and what I'd do is I'd turn a feature on, press record, set off, get to a point in the road, uh, park the car, turn that feature off, set off, and, and so on and so forth. So it was quite a disruptive journey to work, to be honest normally takes me 35 minutes but these journeys took easily uh, 40 45 minutes because I had to keep enabling all these features um, before I uh, then, then at one point I actually had three dash cams on the go at the same time so it got really complicated I had to have a you know a, a, a A4 paper in my car to record what I've done what time I've done it so on and so on and so forth I, you know it got really complex um, the other thing I had to be very mindful of was that um, initially when I started this experiment it wasn't a problem but when I then thought okay I now need to create some dash cam data sets that students can use I then uh, kind of had to make sure that I wasn't starting and stopping recordings outside my home address because I didn't want them to know where I live. So I, 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 I when I did the, the, the data set that's available publicly, the one that I'm quite happy to share with you, I uh, started the rec recording at random places so that it's not, e it's not possible or it's not easy to determine where I actually live. So that was the data gathering. Let me show you now. Um, I'm going to show you a, a clip of what, 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 what the recording then ends up like. Um, and before I show it to you, I just want you to uh, just notice that the screen is clouded over. I did that for every publicly available data set. Um, because I, I I did not want to capture uh, people's registration plates and faces and and so on, so it wouldn't get through our own ethical approval here at Warwick uh, if I was capturing uh, personally identifiable information PII, and that does include uh, registration plates, includes faces and and so on. So there's nothing actually wrong with this dash cam. It's just the way I've recorded it. So I'll press play. Uh, there's, there's not much sound there, or there's barely any sound, but I'll talk through what you're seeing as, as, as it plays. So what you've got here at the bottom 
is you'll notice on the left we've got the model number you've got the time and the date you've got the speed here and you've got a bunch of coordinates here right in the middle here is a registration plate which clearly in this case is not a real registration plate so this is a watermark and um, dash cams most dash cams have a feature where they will enable the user to record a watermark it can be enabled and it can be turned off the interesting thing for me was whether uh, this water, this date and time, for example, was this, you know, it was consistent all the way through all the different places in which I could identify temporal data. And the same with this. And I wanted to also check whether I could find the registration plate anywhere else on the dash cam or did it only exist on the video itself. So there are quite a few things I wanted to discover. I mean, you can see that there's, uh, we can't see much here other than, the, than that it's light. We, if, if it wasn't clouded over, we would see road signs. Um, but I'll come back to things like that later on because there's, the, the research is moving in, uh, you know, in, 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 a, in a certain direction. Uh, there's multiple students doing projects related to this. And I'll talk to you about what they're doing uh, towards the end. So that's typical footage. And if you got hold of one of my data sets, that's what it would look like. Yeah. And here's another one. But uh, so I've got multiple videos, but I'll just move on. So <clears throat> I had multi I've got multiple data sets. Um, this is the one that's publicly available. Uh, eight dash cams, 16 gigabyte cards, recordings made with lots of features turned off and on. Um, and they're imaged so that we've kind of ended up with 10 gigabyte EO1s. They're all on a OneDrive and sharing them simply involves uh, giving you a URL and a password, you know, and then you can, you can access those uh, data sets. So what did I find? Well, this is taken from my uh, paper but let me explain what we see here. So in that paper, we focused on seven dash cams and we have those listed down here. And, and then across here, we've got some of the features that we were looking for. Let's go to some of the easier ones first. Let's go to GPS, so geospatial data. Um, with the Cobra, we had to have the external GPS module, so that Cobra stored nothing. But the next base, it, score, it stored GPS data in the file name. So the file name has it in there, and I maybe come back to that later on. Uh, sorry, not the file name. It's the native video player. I'll show you what that looks like in a second. The native video player that comes with Nextbase. This is a video player um, that you download um, and you drop, drag and drop your Nextbase dashcam uh, videos into that video player. And, and it, it, it does give you a lot of data. Uh, it's not a forensic tool. That is a problem. And it only works with next base uh, devices. So, um, you know, it, it's a problem. And a lot of these now um, are coming with their own native video player. So we can get geospatial data by accessing the native video player. The question really is, well, where is it getting the data from? Well, the native video player is getting it from EXIF data. This is metadata that is stored within the MP4 or the MOV file. That's the bit that we're particularly interested in. Not that bothered that the native video player can extract that and present it. We want to be able to do the same thing, but uh, in, in a manner that forensic investigators can find useful. And we can also find this data in watermarks. So I've shown you some watermarks a few moments ago. <clears throat> Those watermarks, so this is what's happening, let me explain. When the dashcam video is being recorded, as each frame is being recorded, 
the GPS data is being written to the EXIF data and it's also being burnt into the watermark. It's literally being burnt into that frame at the bottom right. So it's not that you're playing that video like you are with the native video players and they're extracting it from there and presenting it to you. The watermark and the EXIF data were written at the same time. So that's just one feature and we can go to other features as well, the speed, um, similar. License plate, you can only extract from the watermark. We couldn't find the existence of license plate data anywhere else. So if the user has configured it, you will see it in the watermark if the watermark feature is turned on. If it isn't turned on, you won't find it in, in there either. Um, and then it gets a tiny bit more complicated where we have things like the emergency mode. I was uh, So let's go to the parking mode first. Parking mode, if you recall, I described it earlier on. Um, and how do we determine that the parking mode was turned on or a recording was made in parking mode? Well, first of all, in some dash cams, we can actually, it actually shows it in the directory structure. What I mean by that is that in the, the, the when you're going to, when you look at the directory structure, there's actually a directory created sometimes just call it parking, yeah? You go into that directory, there'll be a bunch of videos in there and all those videos were made with the parking mode active. So that's one uh, kind of indication that this video was made in parking mode. It was activated, right? The user did not press record here. This was automatically activated, this recording was. The other way of telling is that those recordings are all recorded with the right protection turned on. So the attributes of the file are also an indication that this was this was recorded in, in specific circumstances. That then takes me to the emergency recording uh, feature. With the emergency recording feature, this is, uh, if I go back a bit, if I go back maybe a couple of slides, not a couple, a bit more than that, let's go here. You can see here, just up here on the uh, top left here, you can see this red button. That's the emergency record button. If there's an incident and you want to record it, you press that. When you press that button, sorry, no, it isn't. I do apologize. It's this one on the, the left here at the bottom. That's the emergency record button. You press that and uh, anything it records now will be recorded with the uh, right attributes uh, turned off. So you won't be able to overwrite that recording. It's being protected here. This is another next space and there's the emergency record button there. So uh, where do we find evidence of that? Well, again, there's a special directory called emergency in this case. Any files in there have been recorded with the user having turned on the emergency uh, button. And, and, and with all of these dash cams, those that have this feature, uh, those recordings are always made with the protection turned on. So. I won't go through all of these. Um, there's um, actually a lot more data that, that we looked at. I haven't included all of it here. But there's something I want to come back to here, and that is the time. So what we found was that some dash cams, well, all of them allow the user to configure a time. Yeah. And the user can put in pretty much whatever time they want. And in fact, they could they, they can fake it because they want to show that I'm I was driving at a different time. And uh, they could set it to be uh, in this recording here. They could the time says eleven forty one. That's twenty four hours. So that's eleven a.m. That time could have said four a.m. Right, because the user set it to be, uh, you know, five, six hours uh, behind, seven hours behind. So that could have, it could have been, uh, it could have been that. 
Now, the, the, the thing is, obviously, when we look at the, 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 the scene there, we can tell it is not a 4 a.m. recording. So there's something, if that said for, you know, 441, or 0441, then we'd kind of, we'd need to think about this because the, the, the photograph, the imagery is, is telling us that it can't have been recorded at 4 a.m. So what we found was that the time is uh, represented in the watermarks. It's also represented in the file name. So the file name itself gives you the, the, the time. Uh, we've also got the um, kind of the the, 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 the the kind of the system metadata for that uh, file as well, and then we've also got the EXIF data here that's contained within the file. And what we find in the example I've given you earlier, where the user has set the time to be four hours behind, is that this time here the watermark and the exif data will not be the same okay the watermark the file name data will be the same and that is because these two <clears throat> elements get their time from the system clock they get it from the system clock the EXIF data, however, contains the satellite time. And we, we've got to assume for a moment that the satellite time doesn't lie. So now we, what we will, we will get here are inconsistencies if the user has um, kind of, you know, has, has, has done that setting incorrect time. Okay, so then the next question on my list of questions was, I'm just kind of popping over to look at the time there, 11.38, is, well, how do we extract the evidence? What kind of tools and techniques can we use? Well, first of all, um, I've already told you that, um, just go back a slide, that FTK, that the general forensic tools are not very helpful here. And that's pretty much what inspired some of this research. Um, they don't they don't give us the data we want in any kind of helpful way. In terms of what we would like that uh, data to look like, well, th this is kind of what we would like th th the forensic tools to be able to do for us. Um, this is a dash cam viewer. It's kind of like a generic tool for a, for a, I can't remember which dash, dash cam. We've got the files over here. We've got the video of the file over here. We've got speed at the bottom here. The uh, direction. And then a map of the whole route here. Color coded to represent speed. That's kind of, I suppose, what we would like the tools to be able to do for us. Uh, what the tools actually do for us is this. They give us pretty much nothing. So if you look at the bottom uh, there, um, where, where we're kind of, you know, even when, but this is autopsy, by the way, um, they're not really able to decode. I mean, this file here, 2050 whatever, whatever, dot MOV. I don't know how long that file is. It's probably three minutes worth of um, uh, video but it's got absolutely tons and tons and tons of uh, EXIF metadata in there. And the tool in this case, Autopsy is not able to do much, if anything, uh, with that file, okay? I should have added earlier on, by the way, that a lot of the dash cams also allow you to take a photo, okay? So whenever that you take a photo, that's where you find it. Okay, but I haven't, this particular dash cam, that's the next phase. Um, there were some recordings made in protected mode, none made in emergency mode, none made with the G sensor. That's why you're only seeing three directories there. But let's come back to this. So the, those tools are not very helpful. That's, 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 the, that's the end of it, basically. 
There is, there is a tool that can help. It's a command line uh, utility. It's called Exif Tool. And it was written by Phil Harvey. He's still updating it. So it, it does have good support. And what this command line tool does do is it allows you to just through a command line, uh, a, a, you know, just through what a command like that allows you to extract uh, a lot of metadata from that M, in this case, MOV file. <clears throat> so let's have a look at what, what this, the data is telling us. It's telling us, uh, it's giving us a whole bunch of information about the, <coughs> about the uh, MOV file is three minutes long. That's the create date and time, 2018, 7th of October, 2018. That's consistent with, oh no, it isn't. You can see now there's a disparity now between what autopsy is telling us and what this metadata is telling us. The metadata is telling us that it was modified on the same date at 6.15. Autopsy is telling us that the modified time is 6.06. .06. So there's a disparity. I won't explain that right now, but, but put simply, what, what we see here is the data that was taken from the satellite. What we see here is the system data. That's why there is this disparity. What else is this telling us? It's telling us the make and model. And then what it has is for each frame, for each frame, we have one of these records, so I'll start it here. Down to there. Oh, it won't let me, it won't let me draw. Oh, there it is. There's the, yeah, from there down to there. Not that not, art clearly wasn't one of my favorite subjects when I was at school. Um, so for each frame, we get one of these records. We actually get more, but the command that I've issued uh, of actually EE means embedded extract. It's, there's lots of switches and it's a very powerful tool. There's a lot more we can get out. We can get things like altitude out, which I've not captured there. Uh, and it just depends what switches you use. So I've just got the basic information uh, from there. We can see, the time and that's taken from the satellite we can see the latitude longitude speed the units that the speed uh, was measured in the track and the track reference and that is where this tool is getting this tool is just getting the same data okay that there's the track there's the speed there's the gps positioning and, and, and so well there it is there. there there are the coordinates and there's it being plotted uh, I should have said the wonderful thing about this tool is as the video plays through, this red dot starts moving along the journey. So you can see and you can zoom in. It's absolutely, you know, it's really useful that that, 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 that tool there is, but it's of not little forensic use other than to validate something uh, that we may have found. So let, let me just recap there. So th 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 there's a three minute video I can't remember whether that video was recorded at 24 frames per second, 30 frames per second. I can't remember that. But for every second, there might be 24, 30, how many of these? 60 times that per minute, and then that times three minutes. You can see there's going to be a lot of records, a real lot of data coming out here. So the next thing we can do now is we can extract that data then what we can do is we can convert that data into GPX format. And having converted it to GPX format, we can use open source tools like GPXC. That's this tool here, GPXC. It's open source, really helpful, really useful in plotting this data. 
and we can then plot it and it will plot that data for us. And what QPIX will also do is it will also give us the speed. So you can see, uh, and in fact, we can also plot it in Google Maps. Uh, and you can see again, coming back here, that data there and that there, it's, the, the, the manufacturers of this tool have done pretty much the same thing that I have here. They've taken the data and they've plotted it. Now, there, there are we do come across a few minor little uh, problems. So they're not problems, they're just interesting challenges. So let's have a look at what we've got here. Let's go over here for a second. Um, and um, what we see here is that the vehicle, oh, it won't allow me to zoom and use my red marker at the same time. So, um, okay, so what we see here is that the vehicle is moving down normal roads. And then at this point here at the bottom, I don't know if you can see my hand on the screen, the vehicle seems to almost take off and end up over here on the top right. You see this straight like, diagonal line going across there, and then it starts again and, and continues, right? The reason, that, that, now the question, I, I like to give these data sets to my students because I want them to try and work out what's happened here. Why is it doing that? And, and you, you, you typically get a bunch of students who, who don't even think about what they're seeing and, and they don't try to reason with what's happened there. But you, obviously you get a whole load who, who think, hold on, what's going on here? Let's try and figure this out. What's happened here is that the dash cam was turned off here. Those are the last known coordinates. Turned back on here. Might actually have been turned on over here somewhere, but we have this time to fix problem, which is the time it takes for the GPS to calibrate and triage. Then it's got all the fixes and then it starts recording. So it might actually have been there, it might have been here, it might have been there. We don't know where it was actually turned on, but it was somewhere close by. So last known coordinates, current coordinates, and what GPXC does is it tries to just connect them together as if it's part of the journey. So there, there's an easy way around that. Uh, you have to go into the GPX file and, and and make a small modification to tell GPXC that that actually, you know, that you need to stop there and you need to start there. So those are little kind of interesting problems we get. We've done, you know, lots of work. This is one of my students' uh, dissertations, and he's done a lot of. Is uh, his work is actually really good. He's he's done a lot of mapping work. And what he has done is looked at problems like, uh, so we have this set of coordinates here, and we have the coordinates we've extracted. We have this timestamp here. We have the timestamp that's being extracted. We have some dash cams uh, where for some strange reason, they won't embed the uh, geospatial data within the EXIF file, but they'll stick it into the watermark. So why they do that, we don't know, but um, maybe they've, they've got their reasoning maybe. And so the watermark now becomes the only source of geospatial data. So what this student has done is uh, kind of extract it from multiple, from the watermarks extract it from EXIF and correlate them to make sure they correlate and they generally do and for dash cams where they haven't stored the uh, geospatial data the EXIF to extract it just from the watermarks and plot those and so he's, he's you know there's a lot of kind of work that he he has done I'll talk to you about some of the other research we're doing and some of the other research students that are involved in a, in a little while what we have here, by the way, these different colors are, uh, so with the, with the dash cam, if you recall, uh, if we go back here, I said to you that this, this, this video here is three minutes long. And we've got a lot of three minute videos here. And what this, uh, what this uh, view here is telling us 
uh, is that these are the, the multiple three minute clips. They've just been color coded differently just to differentiate them. And we're playing with all kinds of little tricks, um, kind of, you know, you know, putting them together, presenting the view as one long uh, journey in one color, presenting it like this, if that's how the investigator wants to see it, overlaying it with a, a kind of a, a label. So, you know, you can point somewhere and it will tell you the name of the road, the GPS coordinates and the speed. And we're kind of looking at all, all these different combinations of what would a forensic investigator like to be able to see with this? What would be helpful? Yeah. Um, we're also looking at things like, uh, well, actually I'll come to further research later on. So that's what, that's how, how we extracted. Um, that's how it looks once we've extracted it. That's what we can do with it once we've extracted it. And well, that's a bit of a continuation of that, I suppose. Um, you know, what we, what can we do with it once we've extracted it? Quick time check. We've got eight minutes, then I'll open up for questions. So then the next research question was, can this evidence be forged? Okay, let's have a look at this problem. Um, so when we, this is the directory structure. This is the Jarmin dash cam. You'll have a slightly different uh, structure. You can see the park mode, by the way. I mentioned that earlier on. There it is, park mode. And um, so these, this is where it's stored. And these, this is the folder, the file name structure. In this case, the files are named in sequence. In this case, however, this is the Cobra. The file names have a specific format. And that format is year, month, day. ID, that's a unique identifier. It's just enumerated from one upwards, one, two, three, four, five, and so on. The camera, because some dash cams can have multiple cameras, the one I've got in the car right now has two cameras, one at the front, one facing backwards. So that would be cam one and cam two. And, and, and the type of file this is, that's just a normal video file. That's an emergency file, i.e. the emergency button was pressed or the G sensor was activated or the park mode. Uh, was activated and that's a photograph. So that's the structure. If I wanted to forge something and I wanted to forge dates and times, I would have to forge uh, the, the the dates there and just make sure they all correlate. I'd have to forge these timestamps here. And that, that much kind of, guys, is, is, is pretty straightforward. Anyone with basic operating system knowledge can deal with that, the problem emerges when we get to here, and that is uh, you would then also have to forge 24 records per uh, second to reflect the same. So what I'm getting at is if you wanted to change the date here, and you wanted to say that this recording was not made on the 6th of November, it was made on the 7th of November. Yes, you could forge all of that. But forging this becomes a big problem because you would have to have real intricate knowledge right down to hex level of how the EXIF data is stored. That's the first thing. But then we come to the watermark and you, I, I, my visual kind of knowledge, visualization knowledge does not extend that far. I have no idea how you would forge something like this to also kind of reflect something different. I don't know how you do that. I suspect it is very, very difficult to do. So that's well, the question was, can the evidence be forged? Yes, to a certain point. Um, and that is this bit easy, this bit extremely difficult. But then we get another problem, and that is these coordinates here 
How do you forge those? Because each one of these coordinates, you can see, they are charting a journey, right? And it's a cohesive journey. It makes sense. Once you plot it, it makes sense. If you're going to forge these, you have to forge it so that it still makes sense as far as this map is concerned, that you don't accidentally plot a coordinate over there, then it goes back here, then it goes over there. That again is extremely difficult to do, but it might be a very interesting uh, project. Okay, nearly at the end now, last few, uh, last couple of slides, I think. Um, so I've already told you that there are no tools. I've told you that the watermark evidence could be forged because what you could do is um, you could change the system date time and, and that would kind of, you know, change what you see in the, um, in the dash cam, in, in the video. Um, I've told you about third party tools and, and I've also told you that the evidence exists in multiple places. So what we've been doing is we've, we've, we're developing a bunch of tools really. I think we've got to the point now where we have four or five separate tools developed by separate research students. And this year, what we're going to do is bring it all together into one tool. So we had one student working purely on watermark data and also looking at OCR. So the watermark data we can extract using OCR functions. Uh, but there's also the landmarks. There are maps saying, you know, A45, you know, 100 meters, take a left, you know, whatever. I, I don't know what. Or Norwich, 12 miles. You know, there, there's a whole load of um, landmark data. And he was bringing all that together and he did a, a pretty good pretty good job of that actually i say four students these are the good ones these are the really good projects that we can now take forward um we've done some work in uh correlating the watermark with the exif we've got two different versions of the mapping tool working so we've got two different versions of, of, of just extracting mapping working really well, pretty foolproof. And we've got some timelining tools and, and so on and so forth. And we've got one student working on contextualized speed data. What I mean by that is um, this is maybe not a good example. This is a better example. What we have here is a busy A road, which has a speed limit of 30 miles an hour. And then we've got a whole bunch of small roads, which have speed limits of 20. And across here, there's probably roads where there are schools and they have different speed limits. Is there a way in which we can present the speed data contextually? What I mean by that is just because this map here may be, possibly says that the driver was driving at 70 miles an hour. Well, that isn't a problem because it's on a motorway. However, in this case, it is a big problem because that is an A road and that's a very serious problem if, if, if he was going 70 miles an hour down that road. So we've, we're kind of trying to look at that problem as well. I think by the end of this year, uh, what I'm going to be doing is taking a uh, intern to bring all these tools together into one uh, into one tool. This is what I mean by contextualized speed. So these are speeds here. The different color codes do represent different speeds in this case. And the pink here, which is that one there, is 50 kilometers an hour. But again, we want to know what kind of road it is before we kind of come to any conclusions. So that, ladies and gentlemen, or rather just gentlemen, I think we've only got uh, guys on the call. Uh, that is that is everything we've been doing. There's a lot more work. It's quite interesting. We're, we're now, this year, what I also started was I got hold of a whole box full. In fact, it's sitting here in my office. I could probably pull them up and show them you a box full of body cams. 
a whole lot of GoPros and I've, I've just finalized my order for a whole lot of drones as well. Now with drone forensics, there are actually data sets out there so you can reasonably easily get hold of those, but we want to create our own data set. So it's going to be exciting. I'll be giving that box to a group of students to start doing some recordings around campus and seeing what we can get out of uh, body cam devices. And then when, when, it, when it warms up a bit, we'll get the drones up and do the same with those. Thank you, so I'll open up to uh, questions.